So you are a openly skeptical rationalist, and I know sometimes you say that you're somewhat agnostic, but it seems like you're a mostly atheistic thinker. And uh, several years ago, you applied that perspective to psychedelic hallucination, which became the basis of your psychedelic information theory. Maybe you could offer us here a general thesis of your theory, some of the key ideas, where you see it as useful, and where in hindsight, especially considering your admitted criticism of so-called psychedelic ideas in the last 10 episodes of Dose Nation, where you see psychedelic information theory as falling short? Yeah, okay, so um, somewhere around 2000, maybe, uh, I I kind of got fed up with psychedelic philosophy um, going out into, like I say, things like social theory and religion and stuff that doesn't really have to do with the drugs themselves. And I thought there really needs to be a, a unified model that basically just talks about the brain. I mean, what's going on in the brain? And it, the farther in psychedelics you get away from talking about, you know, receptors and neurons in the brain, the more you're going off into your own fantasy land, I think. Um, and the, the farther, the closer you can get it back to what's actually happening in the brain, I think the more enlightened you will get about, you know, how these substances work. Are they, are they positive for me? How can I use them positively? Uh, are they becoming a negative thing for me? How can I cut out the negative aspects? So the general thesis behind psychedelic information theory is asking the question, how do psychedelics produce hallucination from the neural interaction all the way up to gross phenomenology, hallucination, emotional response, uh, all of the, the, the craziness that happens? Because essentially what you're talking about is a neural interaction. So how does this neural interaction change the brain and affect phenomenology to the point where you're basically stepping out of reality into this dream world. And sort of the core idea behind psychedelic information theory is that through the taking of drugs, you cannot infer new properties or abilities to the brain. You can't give the brain something new that it wasn't born with just by taking a drug. What you're basically doing is taking the existing functions of the brain and rearranging them so that they overlap on top of each other so that you can be awake and dreaming at the same time or you know you can have these multi-layered experiences where you're not just seeing one reality you're maybe seeing two realities or multiple realities fused on top of each other to the point where you can't tell where real hard reality ends and where your sort of fantastical imaginings over reality start. Um, and that's sort of the root of psychosis, where you can't tell reality from dream. You can't tell reality from your, your own paranoia or your own, your own figments. So basically, I tried to map how you know, serotonin systems control uh, the rational thinking of the brain and how disrupting those serotonin systems sort of subvert rationality and your grounding in the moment and allow the dreaming part of the brain that's only supposed to be active in deep sleep to come online and impose itself over what you're seeing in reality. So psychedelic information theory is at root a chemical theory based on you know, all of the research that we know about how psychedelics work in the brain. But then it adds this other piece about what happens with the information that's produced in that in that uh, experience? Uh, where does that information go? Because it doesn't just it doesn't just evaporate into the atmosphere. It stays with you. It affects you. And if it affects you, then that means that there's neural change happening in the event. And that neural change solidifies itself through telling the story of your experience, reliving your experience in your brain. Uh, communicating your experience with other people, and then that experience becomes part of your identity, and then it becomes part of cultural identity. So the the physiological reaction of taking the drug actually produces information in your brain that changes your identity, 
And then through changing your identity, changes your relationship with other people and changes society. So that is the, that's sort of the genesis of psychedelic information theory, thinking about how you throw a stone in a pond and it just ripples out, right? And how far do those ripples go? Depends on how big the stone you throw into the pond. Mm-hmm. So, right, and and how it changes the shoreline of the pond will be determined yes. as by that same thing as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How it changes the way people see the pond uh, uh, from from a distance. Yeah, and and the patterns that you're creating with those ripples then become integrated into art and culture and um, you know symbols of the community um, that are all based on sort of these phenomenological events that happen in your head, basically in a vacuum. I mean, they're basically happening in your head in, in a vacuum. And nobody else has access to those, to those ideas or that information. And it's really up to you post-trip to integrate that information and figure out how it, it, it gets released into society. So, yeah, psychedelics are basically, in this thesis, an information-generating tool. I don't put any uh, qualifying judgments on whether or not it's good or bad information. It's just information that pours out of you. And that information ultimately winds up changing the society that we live in, Hmm. you know, for better or for worse. uh, You, you create all of these new ideas in your head. They have to go somewhere. Right. Whether it's into art or, uh, you know, talking to other people or uh, the way you live your life, your activism, your profession. So, yeah, it's it's not so much talking about psychedelics as a social force or as a religious force or or, or a philosophical, uh, you know, idea that needs to be grappled with. It's about how the change happens at the individual level, at the neural level, and then ripples out into society. So it's and, taking it back to the individual and taking it back to the, the action of, yes, I'm, on purpose, I'm going to do this thing that causes my brain to become like a radio transmitting out to the rest of, rest of the world. And so where do you see the theory falling short? Uh, do, you, it, do you see it falling short? Has, yeah. has, so, has no, new neuroscience and observations like F, fMRIs and stuff in psychedelics, uh, do you see any of it... Um, invalidating your ideas there as well no it's interesting i i wrote it in 2010 i mean i finished it in 2010 it took me you know about five or ten years to write the whole thing and i wanted it to be a a theory that would be sound for at least the next 50 years uh because i don't think the uh the quantity of information that we know about the brain is going to change too drastically in that time we've you know we've kind of discovered almost all there is to discover about the brain. There's still a few mysteries, but I don't expect that there's ever going to be any sort of, uh, you know, discovery about psychedelics of the brain that would completely discount what happens. I mean, what, what, I, what I'm describing in psychedelic information theory. Um, we're not going to learn that psychedelics, you know, <laughs> hit different receptors than they hit or uh, that they're, you know... St- that it's not coming from the brain, it's actually coming from the kidney, right? We're not going to, we're not going to, ha- I don't think there's going to be any revolutions in, in, in neuroscience that's going to discredit what I'm saying in the book. Where I think it falls short is that it doesn't really address, um, you know, the emotional fallout of the trip. It's very much about the phenomenology and the information. So it's very clinical and it's very much about the form the forms that come out of the psychedelic trip, whether they be, you know, kaleidoscopic, you know, artwork or, uh, you know, this sort of demagoguery that can come out through uh, philosophy. Uh, it's, it's, it falls short and, and, you know, it doesn't really give people the, the comfort or the integration or the ability to, to personalize it like, say, a more philosophical or religious theory does. It doesn't say anything about, you know, spirits are going to heal you or that this is going to help you or that this is going to, you know, make you crazy. It's just, it's just, I tried to keep it to the stuff that I could just really say is universal for everybody 
everybody will react to the experience in a different way. And everybody will generate information and have emotional fallout in a different way. But the act of taking the drug and the drug hitting the receptor and the chemical reaction that happens and the phenomenological reaction that happens, that's pretty much universal for everybody. So the book kind of stops there with just sort of the chemical reaction, the, the physiological reaction, and the phenomenology. It doesn't talk about what's the purpose, what's the point, how do we integrate, uh, what's, you know, how does society deal with this? It doesn't cover any of those larger issues. It's just solely about you know, where does the phenomenology come from? And so that's, I think, all it was meant to do and all of these other larger ideas, I'm just gonna let other people uh, take on because I don't, I can't presume to go there for everybody and know what the best path is for the world or, you know, for people's emotions. It's, it's just not for me to say. 